So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for joining today's webinar on multi-stakeholder approaches to addressing local level climate challenges. My name is Edith Hammer. I'm a program specialist at the UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning in Hamburg. And I'm the moderator for today's session. And before diving into the topic of today's webinar, I will provide you with a quick overview of what we can expect today and also in the several next month to come. So today's event is the first one of our newly established webinar series on building green, inclusive and climate resilient urban communities, the Learning Cities approach. The series includes nine monthly webinars on the road to the sixth international conference on learning cities that we're very much looking forward to. The conference will be held uh, in Jubail in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia from the 3rd to the 5th of December later this year. And the theme of the conference is learning cities at the forefront of climate action. So you see that this way well aligned with the broader topic of the conference. And we will actually cover uh, a quite broad scope of themes from climate assemblies, green skills, digital learning for climate action, to countering climate disinformation and also rethinking our relationship with nature. And I would like to invite you to explore all the topics of the coming webinars on the UL website. The overarching objective of these webinars is to bring city representatives and other stakeholders from local level, but also from national level, working on lifelong learning and climate action together to exchange experiences, to learn collectively, and also to support, of course, sustainable action. Today, we have a lot to look forward to. Uh, first, we will hear from Ms. Isabel Kamp. Uh, director of the UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning, and she will give us a brief introduction and officially open the webinar series. Then we will uh, have several presentations, uh, starting with an international perspective on multi-stakeholder processes provided by the UNESCO ESD section. And this will be followed by inputs from three learning cities, uh, from Cork in Ireland, from Bogota in Colombia, and from the city of Yeongbyonggu in the Republic of Korea. Following these short presentations, we will then have time for discussions and we we'll invite the audience to, um, to also provide questions for the panelists. And finally, the closing remarks will be delivered by Raul valdez Cotera, who is the Interim Chief Program Coordinator here at UAL. So before we begin, I would like to provide some key technical details. First, the, the Zoom webinar is being recorded and it will subsequently be shared on the UL Learning Hub, which will soon be available to all the members of the UNESCO GMLC. And if you have any comments that you would like to share during the webinar, kindly use the chat box that is available in the menu bar. And for any questions that you would like to ask the panelists, we kindly ask you to use the Q&A box that you can also find in the menu bar. And so we will do our best to ask, uh, answer as many questions as possible. Also, interpretation will be available throughout the webinar in Arabic, French, Spanish, and Korean. Uh, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you can click on the interpretation button and choose the language that you would like to hear. Please let me at this point also take the opportunity to express our appreciation uh, to our partners that support language uh, interpretation for Arabic interpretation is provided by the Regional Center of Quality and Excellence in Education under the auspices of UNESCO located in Jubail, uh, Saudi Arabia. And uh, Korean interpretation is kindly provided by the Learning City of Poyang in the Republic of Korea. So thanks to our partners for making this possible. And without further ado, let us now hear from Isabel Kemp from the UL Director to begin today's webinar. The floor is yours, Isabel. Thank you so much, Edith. And Edith, really good morning, afternoon, and evening to, to all of you. And I'm very happy to see that we are now over 100 participants. So this is really wonderful. So a really warm welcome to everyone joining our webinar series on building green, inclusive, and climate resilient urban communities the learning cities approach. As you all know, currently cities are responsible for around 75% of global CO2 emissions and therefore play a vital role in the world's collective response to the climate crisis. 
in addition to being really central to the transformation to inclusive and in green economies, cities are also at the forefront of efforts to empower local communities with the knowledge and the skills that are needed to break long established patterns of unsustainable, unsustainable consumption and production, and also the question of mobility. Over the past years, we have witnessed that many of the UNESCO learning cities succeeded in empowering local communities to take climate action. They ensure that lifelong learning for climate action is accessible, impactful, and relevant to the needs of their communities. I would like to take this opportunity to really congratulate all those UNESCO learning cities present here today on their achievements. However, we still have far to go to reach international agreed commitments uh, with regard to climate action. The need to act has, been, has never ever been more pressing than now. Against this backdrop, climate action has become also one of our strategic priorities at UIL. We firmly believe that lifelong learning is crucial for providing everyone with factual knowledge of how the climate is changing and also empower individuals and communities to combat the causes, adapt and build local resilience. We also prom promote lifelong learning for climate action within the context of citizen education, supporting people to become empowered agents in their communities. And I'm very pleased that we will have a chance to discuss many of these issues with experts from UNESCO Learning Cities throughout this webinar series. Many stakeholders have to shape how education and learning for climate action takes place at the local level. And there's really a great value in embracing this diversity of political actors, education and cultural institutions, civil society organizations, youth assemblies, employers, and many other actors that contribute to developing learning cities and combating climate change. So this is what today's webinar is really about, charting a course together, taking action together. We will learn about and exchange on multi-stakeholder approaches to address climate change and challenges at the local level. I hope this really sparks renewed motivation to harness lifelong learning as a human right and public good, and to promote inclusive climate action in learning cities across the globe for greener, fairer, and more sustainable communities. So I really welcome you again and uh, hand over the floor uh, to edit again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Isabel, for this warm welcome and introduction to the UNESCO GNLC webinar series. And uh, I will now uh, pass on the floor directly to Mark Manns. Uh, he's a program specialist uh, working in the section on education for sustainable development in UNESCO Paris. And he will provide an initial input on collaboration for sustainability and climate action across different levels of government. Mark, you have eight minutes and the floor is yours. Edith, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everybody who's joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. A uh, big thank you to UIL colleagues for uh, engaging uh, UNESCO Paris uh, and our ESD section. So as Edith mentioned, I work in the Education for Sustainable Development section at uh, our headquarters in Paris, where we coordinate uh, two uh, primary initiatives that really address this uh, topic today, multi-stakeholder approaches. Uh, the first is the ESD for 2030 program, which uh, was launched in 2020 as the ESD for 2030 roadmap and framework, where we coordinate with uh, all sorts of uh, actors, agents, uh, stakeholders uh, at national, regional, international level, and local level as well. And the other is the recently launched uh, last year, the Greening Education Partnership, which some of you may be familiar with, uh, that looks at greening schools, greening communities, uh, teachers, uh, and uh, the curriculum. So uh, just to, to kick us off again, maybe just to say a few words and to reiterate a little bit about what uh, Isabel mentioned in her opening about 
the the need why we do a multi-stakeholder approach uh, again it's it's the, in the spirit of democracy and bringing people together, uh, in engaging actors that, uh, you know, from civil society to the private sector, uh, not just government actors who, who might be best positioned, but bringing everybody together to come together and collaborate on, on sort of actions and, and ideas uh, to make uh, local communities, uh, national communities engaged and feel ownership uh, so that we can all be, move forward uh, to address resiliency, climate action, or what other what other issues that might be pressing in your context. For us, I'll talk a little bit about our ESD for 2030 program. Uh, this program, uh, its primary uh, goal is to get countries to mainstream education for sustainable development at all levels. This includes at the policy level, either national policy or local level policies. It includes looking at learning environments. How do we strengthen learning environments in school through teaching and learning processes or through infrastructure? How do we build the capacity of educators uh, and stakeholders? Uh, empower the youth uh, who can become agents of change in the future to address uh, our, our challenges. And the last one is really to accelerate local level actions uh, to mainstream ESD. And since 2020, we've now engaged 102 countries worldwide to initiate and develop what we call an ESD for 2030 country initiative. So this involves national stakeholders. Uh, may, maybe it's a national ministry of education, but then they have to also engage with local level actors, academics, teachers, schools, uh, civil society uh, actors, and they have to come together to to agree on a certain vision for how they want to pr proceed in terms of education for sustainable development uh, through formal, informal, non-formal uh, levels of education as well. So this is the, this is one of our primary goals, and and we work hard with with our countries to and and uh, uh, regional stakeholders to push these agendas at the national and local level. A few key examples of those. So of those uh, 102 that I mentioned here, I, I just want to give you a few key examples. And we'll start with a few different approaches. In the top right, you have Germany, which has really developed a, we a well-coordinated and comprehensive national platform on ESD. And this uh, led by the National uh, Ministry of Ed or the Federal Ministry of Education, but involves over 500 stakeholders and actors. Uh, and this would be in organizing working groups on different thematic areas of uh, sustainable development or climate action, uh, involving expert technicians to, to push forward the agenda, uh, working together with civil society and partners uh, to, to engage these things. So working not only at the national level, but working down through local actors and local stakeholders to come together with this comprehensive view. So it's a well-organized and comprehensive view of a national program that works with, with other levels. A second example uh, that is slightly different, but that works at all different levels as well, is, is a, an example from Ireland, the Ireland Student Union, uh, or the Ireland Second Level Student Union. So this is a student union that's comprised of different youth representatives um, from secondary education. And they work not only at the local level to support uh, activities in their schools, but they actually get seats on national committees. For example, the Climate Action Plan. So the ISSU gets to have a seat on national processes to discuss and to contribute to how Ireland moves forward with their Climate Action Plan, as well as uh, other things like the national uh, curriculum and assessment framework. Um, so they have uh, not only uh, a voice at the local level, but also at the national level. And lastly, you can see from an engagement there, the Ireland also sits on a regional body, which is the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. So the ISSU sends representatives uh, to sit on the UNICE Steering Committee for Education for Sustainable Development as well, to coordinate uh, actions at the regional level. The last two examples look more at local level actions sort of spurred on by local level actors that feed into the national agenda. Uh, the first one is in Vina del Mar, Chile. So this was an activity that was designed by uh, local uh, schools and, and NGOs 
to address uh, wetland res restoration. So uh, directly trying to address the impacts of climate change and climate resiliency uh, to address biodiversity loss. So the schools and NGOs work together to design uh, a, a, a non-formal or informal uh, teaching and, and learning activity in, in the surrounding communities. So on, one, on the one hand, they're working with the schools, but on the other hand, they're then engaging with the local communities to strengthen capacities to deal with biodiversity loss. And all of that feeds directly to their national ministries of environment or ministries of education. So those processes then work upwards in that, in that manner. The last example I'll give you today um, is uh, a city in Japan, this Kesenuma city in Japan, which is on the northeast side of Japan, which was devastated by the 2011 earthquake and tsunami. So following that uh, disaster, the town decided it needed to strengthen its resiliency. It needed to build in, up some, some uh, activities and promote resiliency and strengthen the community bonds uh, of the city. So one example they came up with was the city working together with the local elementary schools decided to embrace their life uh, living with the sea. It's a, it's a coastal town that's embraced a long history of um, fishing uh, and um, uh, marine culture. Uh, so they've designed a, a curriculum uh, at the primary level with local experts and local industries uh, at each grade, they have set targets, what they have to do. And you can see an example here is the schools have to go visit fishing vessels and understand the, the relationship that the fishing community has with their, the local community. They also work with other experts to, to explore marine life and so on. So that's one example of, again, a bottom-up approach where the, the local uh, actors working together with all sorts of stakeholders, and that feeds into uh, a national initiative as well. I'll end there. Um, just a quick reminder again, uh, we have two, two main projects and, and uh, one other, just a reminder on the Greening Education Partnership, which uh, also talks about um, local level actions and, and engagement. Uh, the Greening Education Partnership will soon be launching a green school quality standards. Uh, and so this process as well was designed through a collaborative consultative process with schools, national ministries, uh, local stakeholders to design and determine uh, what exactly it means to become a green school and what exactly the standards might be. Um, and so you'll be seeing more on that uh, in the coming months as it as it get launched. It, it gets launched closer to summertime. With that, uh, I will stop there. Thank you very much and uh, look forward to the rest remaining speakers and your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark, for your for your presentation and showing us um, how um, climate action and, and education for sustainable development really needs to be promoted at different levels and how these different levels need to interact uh, with each other and how they do in, in different countries. Um, thank you also for pointing out to the important work done by um, the ESD for 2030 uh, group and for the Greening Education Partnership, please. Um, uh, you feel free to also share the link to the to the Greening Education Partnership in the in the chat. I think it will be highly interesting for many of our participants um, to also follow that. And um, well, thank you for for sharing the the country initiatives. One of them was Ireland, and I think this is a a good um, link over to our next speaker, Dennis. Um, Dennis uh, Barrett is the Learning City Coordinator uh, from the City of Cork in Ireland and we much look forward to hearing from uh, the experience of Cork in multi-stakeholder partnerships and uh, Dennis the floor is yours you have five minutes and I would kindly ask you to try to keep within the time frame thank you thank you Edith and uh, greetings to everybody greetings from Cork in Ireland um, I'm very pleased to join with you today to share our experiences and to learn from yours. Our learning city, uh, when you see me as the focal point, I always say that you can not see all of the partners behind me. Uh, our formal learning partners, our non-formal learning partners and our informal learning partners. Uh, as four lead formal partners and many, many strategic partners, uh, we take a partnership approach to developing our city as a learning city. Uh, very pleased to work with UNESCO for many years. Um, and we have asked ourselves the question in a recent planning uh, event, 
what do we need as a city to learn now? And one of the big answers that came back was we need to learn about climate change. So as you can see from this uh, photograph of our city, we're a coastal city and that brings about uh, the risk of flooding. There have been regular floods in city centre for many years and the discussion that has already taken place has uh, shown some of the challenges that we face. A lot of opposition to flood defence, uh, um, different solutions that are being proposed. Uh, so any new moves need that consensus approach that was mentioned by Edith and by Mark. As a UNESCO learning city, uh, we also work very closely with the Healthy Cities uh, team in Cork. We're a cultural city, an age-friendly city, and we pride ourselves on working together. Our approach to uh, sustainable development and to climate change was uh, hugely inspired by the conference that we were really pleased and honoured to host in 2017 with UNESCO on the theme of Global Goals, Local Actions. It was the third international conference on learning cities, and it was fantastic to be joined at that time by cities from right around the world. The outcome document of that conference was the Cork Call to Action, and it called on cities at that time to deliver the, all of the sustainable development goals through being a green and healthy learning city, an equitable and inclusive learning city, and to support decent work and entrepreneurship. So all 17 of the goals were focused through those uh, through those pillars, and we've continued to look to those pillars to guide us in our development ever since. So the national and local context in Ireland, uh, the climate change agenda, climate change work is uh, very immediate and very urgent. And this photograph of a young man at a rally uh, speaks to that. TikTok, the, the clock is ticking and Taoiseach is our prime minister. And just today at 12 noon, uh, we just heard the news that our Taoiseach is going to step down. So things are always changing in governments and in local government, and that in itself creates a challenge. But Ireland has declared a climate and biodiversity emer emergency, and Cork City was one of the first climate uh, teams to be put in place to respond to the emergency local locally. And we have legislation in place uh, that requests us to develop uh, climate action plans. And that is also informed by Cork joining the EU mission cities, uh, setting out to be carbon neutral by 2030, net zero. Uh, and there are a range of, work, of different networks that Cork is part of across the EU that uh, frames our policy in this. And then at local level, uh, following a large process of consultation, we now have signed off uh, by our local government, the Cork City Climate Action Plan. So that sets out a whole range of actions uh, to implement this up to 2029. So again, looking at that 2030 uh, deadline that Edith spoke about earlier. So for us as a learning city, we have strong models to engage all the formal partners, non-formal and informal partners. And there's great work being done in schools and universities, the green campus movement, the green schools movement. And it was great to see Mark's example of our second level students union. But our question is how can we bring uh, dialogue, how can we bring climate change for dummies is one challenge for people not to be afraid to ask about climate change or the climate curious, which our climate action team who have started to work with us with our learning city team much more closely since they were put in place. How can we empower all of our citizens to ask the questions and take the actions that are relevant? And these are some of the examples that are happening already that we can build on very practical actions at local level in our six learning neighbourhoods and across all our uh, events in our festival. We have over 400 events and the green and healthy events are very st strongly represented across them all. And then at the more strategic level, uh, our Learning City lead partners have created a, a forum for leadership in the city to ask ourselves as a city, how can we implement all 17 of the sustainable development goals by 2030. And that has created some really heartening outcomes. Our Chamber of Commerce, which represents industry, for example, has taken on the SDGs as one of their core priorities. 
I'm going to leave it there. Our festival is coming up just after Easter. I always end with a big welcome. You're always welcome to visit our city. Uh, we need to learn about climate change. We need to learn it urgently. As Isabel said, we have far to go. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Dennis, for these insights into uh, the, uh, the experience of, of Cork, both the very practical experience like the uh, Learning Festival, but also the very strategic work that you're doing in Cork, um, as you mentioned, the Cork Climate Action Plan, which I think is a, an excellent example of um, also developing a, a holistic or whole city approach um, to, to climate change education and climate action. Um, we are now jumping over to another region. Um, I would like to give the floor next to uh, Gabriella, uh, Miss Gabriella Arroyo Kobi uh, from the International In and Interinstitutional Relations Office, uh, the District Secretariat of Education in Bogota, Colombia. We are very pleased to have you and to learn about the initiatives uh, going on in Bogota. And uh, please, the floor is yours. You also have five minutes for your presentation, Gabriella. Thank you. No, thank you so very much, Edith. I'm just going to share my screen for a minute. So uh, good morning to everybody here in Colombia. We are at uh, it's 7.30 a.m. So um, good morning and welcome you with a little coffee. Uh, as uh, Edith mentioned, I come from Bogota, Colombia, which is a, a very big city in the top of Latin America. And which ha and we have worked towards creating this um, government idea of of solving problems such as uh, uh, sustainable development. So a little bit of context about the city I'm in. We have around eight million people living in the city. So as you might imagine, it's not as big as huge cities like um, New York, but we are one of the biggest cities here in Latin America. We became part of this very, very important network in 2019, confirming that we are a city that is committed with lifelong learning and the sustainable development goals. We produce around 24.4% of our nation's GDP. So as you can imagine, we also produce a huge amount of contamination and CO2. And this is important for what we're speaking. We, our administrative uh, division is composed of 15 different sectors. So we have the educational sector, the cultural sector, and all of this is composed of around 72 in, uh, public institutions that uh, take care of the different aspects of our city. So as you can imagine, a city like Bogota with, the, with so many inhabitants has multiple problematics that we are trying to solve through the development of the SDGs. And what we have done is we have created a um, governmental type of solution to these problematics as a way to say, hey, we cannot solve the problem of lifelong learning only from the educational sector, or we cannot solve the problem of sustainable development only from our uh, climate change office. We have to create a transversal type of solution from different type, different parts of the city. This is something we have done not only with time, uh, with sustainable development, but also with lifelong learning opportunities for the young and our newest care system, which is uh, a, a, a bet that we have uh, implemented over the last four years. Um, so with this webinar, we are forced to ask ourselves two big questions. First, why is the city as Bogota needed to implement these sustainable measures? And second, why is it needed for us to have a multi-actor approach? So the first question is very easy and it's even take it even takes us to our SDGs, uh, SDG 11 specifically with uh, uh, community and sustain sustainable communities and cities. And it's basically that uh, what IPC cities and climate change science conference discover is that 17% of carbon dioxide in the world is produced by our cities. It's no, it's it's actually not a mystery or it's no surprise that this is so taking into consideration that right now 56% of city uh, of the of the world population lives in big cities. And the, the World Bank actually calculates that seven in 10 uh, 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 people will be living in cities by 2050. And the second question of why do we need multi-actor 
um, solutions can be seen not only on the multiple aspects that you have to take into consideration when speaking about sustainable development, but also on even on the way we manage our SDGs. So for example, something and something as basic as water, and 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 I, I take you to the SDG six. Here in Bogota, we have our own company for water. But this company cannot work alone because here in, in, in our city, we have a problem where citizens were throwing trash into the streets. This trash ended up in the in in, in the sewage system. It was blocked. And when it rained, I mean, it's a mountain city, so it rains a lot. Uh, they were completely blocked and we would also have uh, floods around the city. Uh, something as simple as residue uh, functioning, for example. Uh, we can, we do not only we have here in Bogota many companies that manage our residues together with the with the aqueducto, which is the the water sewage system. However, we cannot continue to work uh, just taking out the, what what was left all the residues to these huge compounds where we store them. Uh, we had to work also with the private sector to tell them, hey, we need more sustainable production and consumption, taking us back to our SDG number twelve. And we also couldn't talk about uh, air quality in our city. As you imagine, we have we we do have a huge air quality problem, and that usually was managed by our um, uh, environment office here in Bogota, the Secretariat for em Environment. However, we also needed to talk about health because how uh, how is our how is air quality affecting the health of our citizens? And as you may have imagined the whole thing, we can't do all of these without talking about lifelong learning. Because if we do not teach citizens how to take better care of the environment, how to take care of natural species that we have here in Bogota, if we do not take care of, um, if, if we do not teach them about having sustainable consumption or, or something as basic as recycling, everything that the city was gonna be doing was not gonna be as, eff as uh, effective. We actually had uh, at the at the beginning of the year a very um, important crisis because uh, Bogota is surrounded by mountains, and our mountains just started having spontaneous fires because of a uh, of a uh, heat wave we are experiencing. And the, the one of the basic things that we had the problem was we started having bad air quality, which has started affecting the health of citizens. And we also started to, to teach citizens how to take care of their forests so that we didn't have more fires to control. So I just wanted to share very quickly some of the experiences that we have that show how we have to work together as a whole district and not as individual stakeholders so that we can solve the multiple problematics that the sustainable development uh, imposes. So Bogota has had a 10 year uh, run in this in, in the implementation of sustainable uh, projects so that we can really become a sustainable city. And the and learning and citizenship development have been essential in this task. So, for example, one project we have is the Pact for Bogota for new for air quality. It's called Project uh, Plan Aire. It's a plan that the idea is to uh, develop all the way to 2030. And this is primarily developed by your Secretariat for Environment. However, this secretariat also needs to get to schools so that we can teach students on how and, and, and engage students and their communities in protecting uh, air quality and knowing how to take how to react when we have bad air uh, quality. So that implied we also as a secretary of education had to be involved. But this also implied the secretary of health because we also had to start checking how air quality was affecting the health of our citizens. And we also had to engage the private sector because we have to go to them and make them join this pack so that we realize that even the, the most little help can actually make uh, help us go a long way in terms of air quality. The second experience, I think it's just basically <laughs> explains itself how it's a multi-actor um, uh, proposal. We have a research project going on with the MIT and a very important university here in Bogota called Universidad del Rosario. And this is a project that wants to test how air quality, oh, sorry, 
how air quality affects learning in school environments. Uh, this meant that not only were we working with two universities in two different countries, we were also working with the Secretariat for Environment and we are working with the Secretariat of Education. And we were working with Bloomberg who gave us the funds for the project. Here in Colombia, we also have something called the PRAE, which, is, which are projects for environmental uh, learning. They're mandatory for all our schools. However, each school has to implement its own PRAE. These are, uh, these are followed by the Secretary of Education, which helps schools implement them. But what has become very interesting is that they have also gone towards the community. A big example is how, for example, one school, which is located very near a very important river here in Bogota, realized that the community was throwing garbage into the river that was making it um, uh, to... Uh, Contaminate, that was contaminating the river, and that was actually heard in the community, which also took water from the river to survive. So they started this whole project around how to clean the river, but also how to teach the community to not throw trash or not dispense of, of, of things in the house into the river so that they could have a better environment altogether. And some of this prize, we work together with the private sector, meaning that we, with a simple curriculum uh, objective. We have actually uh, joined together with different secretariats, the se private sector and the communities. And finally, in something we're very proud of here in Bogota is, our, is La Rolita, which is this amazing transportation system that it's only women, uh, that it's uh, only handled by women. So it's, it's, uh, it's a fleet of buses which are driven by women. So here we have the Secretariat of uh, Economic Development. The Secretary Adriana, sorry to interrupt. May, you, uh, may I ask you to take maybe one more minute um, to, oh. to complete your presentation? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, I was finishing up. So sorry. And um, basically all these buses are sustainable. They're electric, meaning that we have also solved the problem of transportation with sustainable development. And just to finish up, I just would like to invite all of you to our forum for learning cities, Latin American learning cities, which will be held here in Bogota in the second semester. We are very proud to be able, and it's organized by the Latin American Network of Learning Cities. And thank you so very much. Thank you so much, Gabriela, uh, for this really interesting insight. And I think you showed very well how different environmental uh, issues and, and challenges uh, in a city um, are interrelated um, and that we cannot uh, treat one issue like transportation or waste management or uh, clean water or a flood um, as a single uh, topic or a single challenge, but that it's a quite complex environment um, that you're dealing with. And um, thanks also for um, pointing out the different kinds of collaborations uh, that are happening in the city between the private sector, but between also um, different entities uh, in the local government of the education sector and the environmental sector. Uh, I think this is something that we can also come back uh, to in the in the discussion. I would now uh, like to again move to another region, uh, to the city of Eung Pyong, and um, uh, I'm very pleased to, that we have with us uh, Eun uh, Yo, and um, she uh, is the team leader of citizenship education in the city of Eung Pyong. And uh, without further ado, I give you the floor. You have also five minutes. Thank you. Okay. Oh, 안녕하세요. 대한민국 서울 은평구 시민교육팀장 전은옥입니다. 이번 웨비나에서 은평구 사례를 발표하게 되어 영광입니다. 다음 장으로 넘겨주시기 바랍니다. 시작에 앞서 은평구청장님의 환영 인사를 먼저 듣고 오시겠습니다. 스코 글로벌 학습도시 웨비나에서 은평구의 규 위기 대응 사례를 발표할 수 있게 되어 영광입니다. 
기후 위기는 전 세계가 직면한 심각한 문제입니다. 지구 온난화, 자연 재해, 생태계 파괴 등이 세계인의 삶과 행복을 위협하고 있습니다. 이에 우리는 기후 위기 대응을 위한 학습 도시 차원의 실천을 더 이상 미룰 수 없는 시점에 도달했습니다. 특히 지역 차원의 다양한 이해 관계자 간의 협력이 절실합니다. 은평구는 탄소중립거리 조성, 탄소중립 주민 실천단 운영, 생활 폐기물 감량을 위한 111 운동 등 기후변화를 위한 다양한 주체의 실천이 이루어지고 있습니다. 이번 웨비나를 통해 푸른 지구를 위한 지역 차원의 실천 방안에 대해 나누고 함께 생각해 볼수 있는 시간이 되었으면 좋겠습니다. 지속 가능한 지구를 위한 학습도시 조성을 위해 SC는 모든 분께 존경과 경의를 표하고 이만 인사를 마치겠습니다. 여러분 감사합니다. <목소리> 네, 저희 청장님의 환영 인사에서 또 보셨듯이 은평구의 기후위기 대응을 위한 지속가능 도시 구현의 핵심 키워드는 주민 주도의 참여와 실천입니다. 다음으로 넘겨주시기 바랍니다. 네, 이를 위해서 저희 은평구에서는 은평형 2050, 2050 탄소중립 추진 계획을 6개 분야 35개 프로젝트로 수립하고 추진하고 있습니다. 다음 넘겨주시기 바랍니다. 지방정부 차원에서의 은평구는 도시 기반이나 시설을 친환경적으로 구축하는 데 힘쓰고 있습니다. 그러나 효과적인 기후위기 대응 목표 달성을 위해서는 다양한 이해관계자의 관심과 참여가 반드시 동반되어야 한다고 생각되어 은평에서는 민간, 교육기관, 주민단체 등이 함께 기후위기 대응 실천을 해오고 있으며 대표적인 사례를 간략히 설명드리겠습니다. 먼저 민간 부분에서는 은평 그림 모아모아라는 사업으로 주민이 주 1회 지정 장소 및 지정 시간에 직접 현장에서 분리 배출하는 사업으로 자원 재활용과 쓰레기 감량에 효과적인 사업입니다. 또한 지역 내 상점과 식당 등과 협약을 체결하고 노 잔반 캠페인 등 음식물 쓰레기 감량 운동을 진행하고 있습니다. 두 번째로는 관내 초등학교, 중학교, 고등학교에서 청소년을 대상으로 생태 전환 교육과 탄소 중립, 탄소 제로, 친환경 그대로를 주제로 한 탄탄대로 프로젝트를 진행하여 미래를 이끌어갈 청소년에게 기후위기 심각성을 알리고 있습니다. 그 외에 비형식 교육기관으로는 평생학습의 허브기관인 은평구 평생학습관에서 우리 동네 배움터라는 지역 내 접근성이 좋은 다수의 교육공간에서 환경교육 및 주민 실천이 이루어지고 있으며 생태환경 마을강사 양성 과정을 통해 생태환경 지역강사를 길러내어 환경교육이 필요한 학교 및 단체 등의 보조강사로 활동할 수 있도록 지원을 하고 있습니다. 또 에너지 교육기관인 은평체인지 2050 카페에서는 예약한 학교나 찾아오는 방문, 방문객을 대상으로 환경과 신재성 에너지 교육, 체험 활동 등을 진행하고 있습니다. 마지막으로 기후위기 대응 실천의 핵심인 주민단체의 실천 활동입니다. 주민 주도의 1일 1세대 100g 쓰레기 감량 운동은 주민 참여 111 운동을 시작으로 주민이 스스로 사업을 계획하고 추진하는 주민 참여 예산 사업, 주민 자치의 환경 특화 사업 운영, 탄소 중립 주민 실천당 구성 등 주민 주도의 기후 위기 대응 사업을 운영하고 있습니다. 진정한 기후 위기 대응을 위해 중요한 것은 실천이며 지역 사회 구성원 모두의 참여입니다. 앞으로도 은평군은 지역 단위의 참여와 실천을 이끌어내기 위해 노력할 것입니다. 이상으로 발표를 마치겠습니다. 감사합니다. 
Thank you very much for uh, your insights into the city of uh, Umpion uh, and for, for sharing these experiences. Um, thanks also to the city of the Umpion um, uh, that has been very active also in the uh, uh, working group on education for sustainable development within the global network of learning cities and has been a very steady and con uh, committed partner. Um, I would now like to open the floor for questions. We have some time left. Um, I, uh, you as participants have the possibility to either um, send us your questions in the Q&A box, uh, but also we, as we have some time left, you can also raise your hands and um, we will be able to unmute yourself if you have any comments, any additional experiences also to share from your side. We very much um, uh, would like to provide this opportunity. So just um, raise your hand and, and let us know. Um, for now, then I would have one question indeed, um, as we are waiting for questions from the participants. Um, we know from uh, that multi-stakeholder engagement uh, is a kind of ideal situation of how to build a process in a city. And uh, we also know from the experiences of some of our uh, GNLC member cities that uh, this can be also a challenging process to get partners on board, uh, also within the city administration or the city council to get the, the education stream uh, committed to work with the environmental stream. We know that um, sometimes uh, lifelong learning and, and non-formal education is not the, um, uh, the, the, the key aspect of a holistic uh, climate action strategy. And sometimes the, um, the education sector has to fight to get their role in the, uh, in the local strategies. So I would be interested um, from your side as uh, also to learn from the experience, how did you facilitate uh, to get partners on board and to also deal with the tensions that may come up uh, between uh, different sections in the um, in the city uh, administration, but also with the private sector. And what would you recommend uh, on how to start the participatory process to also achieve a long term commitment? Um, I don't know who would like to start. Maybe maybe Dennis. Can I can I give the floor to you to to share your experience on that? Well, thank you, Edith. Um, I'm happy to share some of some things that work for us in Cork. And um, obviously, as you say, there are challenges. Um, I, re I reflect really on um, one of the good things that came from the COVID years uh, was that all the partners in the city really had to work together on that crisis. And it strengthened the bonds that were already there because the responses needed formal partners uh, they needed community level responses and they needed all the supports of the uh, private sector as well. So that COVID time, while it was a, a real concern for us in Cork, it, it bound our partners together. Uh, when we set out to uh, create a new plan for climate action or for our learning city, we have different workshops for the different sectors. And I found that that, that, that was a good way to um, to do uh, honour to the efforts of the community and voluntary sector and in a separate workshop uh, and have a separate workshop for some of the leaders within our uh, city council, for example. Um, and then finally, the other example that I'd like to share that I felt worked well was the SDG leadership uh, session we did. And anyone that was invited to that was uh, selected carefully because they may, they may not have been in the chief executive role in their um, organization, uh, but they still had a leadership role to play. And I think that word leader is what we need now. We need leadership at all levels. So in that session, we had a mix of uh, private sector, uh, public sector and community voluntary sector. And every one of the 75 people we brought together in 2020, looking at the, the next 10 years uh, was there partly in um, to do respect to their role currently, but also to challenge them. Can you be a leader in this? So those were just three different examples uh, that we found that worked for us in Cork, but it is a challenge, as you say, Edith. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dennis, for these very um, specific um, yeah, experiences um, uh, that I think could also be really informative and, and potentially replicated in, in other contexts. Um, I don't know, uh, Gabriella or Eunok, if you also want to, um, or also Mark, of course, um, to respond to that. Uh, I very much invite you to take the floor. And then we, I also see that we have another question in the, in the chat. Yes, Gabriela, please. <laughs> well, um, here in Bogota, as I was telling you, we have been developing this whole uh, project for over 10 years and something very difficult that we have to face is the communities itself. So reteaching communities to take care of their environments, teaching them basic stuff that sometimes you, some people may think that uh, everybody knows, but it, it, it's not as common knowledge as people think. So working with communities, integrating their problematics uh, into the public policy has been a challenge. Uh, we have open channels so that we can know what the different aspects they are suffering. For example, we may have a community that's suffering from water issues while we are having another that is having a problem uh, because they live near a um, waste management area. So it has also been uh, the the uh, a situation where we have to take into consideration the different aspects of the community and how they are affected by climate change and how we implement those into our public policy. We also have um, worked together with the private sector, which I think it's fundamental when you're working in in in, fun, in international in sustainable development, because without their help, whatever public policy that we're implementing may not be as effective as we want. So getting the whole city to work towards this goal has been our primary primary objective, not only working as government entities, but working as a city as a whole. I think it's the most important aspect. And working not only in, in how to solve the issues, but how we teach everybody, not only our students, but also the educational community as a whole, parents, take cares, uh, private sector to see how their influence can help achieve this goal of sustainable development. I think that's how we ha as a city have seen a multi-stakehold uh, approach. Thank you so much, Gabriella. Thank you. So we have a, a little time left. I would like to um, share a question from the chat from uh, Jürgen Falko Schubert from Hamburg. Um, and he asks, are there some official established multi-stakeholder groups from educational area for consulting the parliamentary or administration of the cities. Um, so would um, someone like to respond to that? Maybe you have an experience from Eung Pyong uh, about multi-stakeholder groups. I think somehow um, we we partially could respond that question already um, also from, from Dennis and, and Gabriella. Um, but if you would like to add something um, to, to officially established. Yeah, please, Dennis. Uh, thanks, Jürgen. And again, again, it's great to have you with us today because your work uh, on educational sustainable development uh, and the clusters is very impressive. Um, one of the officially established and supported um, groups in our city is our Community Response Forum. And that includes um, a broad range of stakeholders it was, as I said, strengthened during COVID uh, because that group was broadened uh, to include uh, a focus on uh, what the needs were, the educational needs that, that were um, problematic during the COVID years. Uh, but the members um, voted to retain it uh, and to, to bring it together to respond to any new um, situation in the city. So that included in recent years um, how the city responds to a big upsurge in uh, refugees, um, Ukraine, Ukrainian refugees and other migrants arriving in our city. And then now that group has also um, decided that it is an appropriate group to look at uh, how we as uh, multi-sectoral partners can respond to climate change. So that group has the support of the chief executive of our city council and our mayor. We have, we have two roles in, in our system in Ireland. So that's that's one example that is uh, officially established. And then at much low, more local level, our learning neighborhoods steering groups 
have all the partners represented as well. So there's there's two levels really in um, in Cork that that a local or a community or or any voice can be heard. Uh, thanks, Edith, and thanks for the question, Jurgen. Thank you so much, Dennis. Um, we have very little time left, but I would like to pose this last question and um, maybe just to allow for one answer to it, because it's, it's uh, I think, a quite crucial one, and that's related to the financing of, of climate action and um, uh, climate education initiatives um, from uh, Tierro. I can't see from which city, um, but uh, he's asking about uh, the mobilization of funds to finance uh, actions not only through subsidies, but also through um, green climate funds like carbon credits, uh, plastic credits or others. So I don't know if you have experience on such practices. I don't know, Mark, if you have any experience on that from your research that you did or um, if we, um, if uh, Gabriella or uh, Eunok has uh, an experience on the financing, then please feel free to take the floor for a very brief response to that uh, in terms of financing yes this is always the the uh, <laughs> the difficult question um uh, yes usually when we work with the uh, as i mentioned uh, our programs usually start at the country level rather than the local level or city level so we're we're trying to tap into uh, mechanisms already addressing national level so the finances that uh, a federal government or, or a national level government of the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Environment can provide. Um, then it's up to them uh, to try and mobilize additional sources by engaging, for example, private stake, private sector actors uh, at the national level to see where they can come and fit uh, into play. Um, uh, again, um, we're not coming to them with money to, to do these activities. Uh, we, it's a partnership between ourselves as well as the country to, to try and initiate and to develop a country level action. Number one, partly, um, is to, to enhance the sustainability of the program itself. Uh, if in the initial, initial planning, we can mobilize resources that are already existing at the national or local level, uh, then we don't get into that trap where you start and stop a project based on the availability of funds. Um, that may or may not come from external donors and so on. So uh, just a, a quick uh, summary on, on how we approach things and, and how uh, we try to approach the financing aspect in, in terms of sustainability to, to mobilize uh, as many actors to, to provide and, and to support. Thank you so much, Mark. I know we are running a bit late, but I would like to also uh, give uh, the floor to um, Eunok uh, from Eun Pyong, uh, who has raised a hand. Please take the floor. Hello,我是Eunok,我是Eunok,我是Eunok,我是Eunok,我是Eunok,我是Eunok,我是Eunok,我是Eunok,我是Eunok,我是Eunok,我是Eunok,我是Eunok,我是Eunok,我是Eun
uh, UNESCO's or URL's collaboration with the FutureLearn platform about uh, free online courses for residents in UNESCO learning cities. Um, please check it out. And um, now the floor is yours, role for the closing remarks. Thank you very much to all the panelists so far. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edith. It was very interesting to listen to participants and speakers gaining a better understanding of the importance of a multi-sectoral uh, older approach to promoting lifelong learning for climate action. In particular, I would, would like just to highlight the pivotal roles that play in the world's response uh, of cities to the climate crisis. Cities are really at the forefront of efforts to empower local communities with the knowledge, the skills, uh, that we need to break a long established patterns to unsustainable consumption. Uh, and on that sense, we, we could hear from uh, some of the learning cities uh, how they are empowering their local communities to take climate actions. And this is really essential. Uh, I will not go into the details of the cities because uh, I think it was quite rich, but we, uh, we don't have much time. I just would like to take this opportunity to congratulate all those UNESCO learning cities uh, uh, that present here today on their achievements in this regard. I was certainly, uh, uh, it was certainly a great way to start our webinar series. This is the, the first one of nine, and we are looking forward to the discussion in the upcoming sessions. Uh, I would like to thank all speakers, participants, and the UL team for making this session possible. Interpreters, thank you very much. We kindly invite you uh, all, all to join the upcoming webinars of our series. You can see the full calendar and more information about each webinar on our website. And we would like also to remind you that you can express your interest in presenting in one of the next webinars via the online survey shared for our team uh, by our team. If you have any questions, please feel free to send us a message. And finally, we would warmly like to invite you to join our I'm a Lifelong Learning campaign, presenting testimonies to the power of lifelong learning from across the globe. You can find further information in the chat. We wish you a very nice morning, afternoon, and evening. Thank you very much to all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Edith. Thank you, Edith. Thank you, Edith.